Hi there crew and welcome to another update on the evolving and ongoing volcanic situation in Iceland. I am geology professor Sean Wilsey. Thanks for joining me. Today is Sunday, April 21st. It's about 8.15 mountain daylight time, about 2.15 in the afternoon in Iceland. And today what I have prepared for us is a quick look at some of the news and update, but I mainly want to look at a, a few models, a few drawings I put together that might help explain what might be happening underneath this area just north of Grindavik. So let's get right to it. Uh, we can see here on the webcam our friendly little spatter cone. So we do have the eruption still continuing. Inter intermittent bursts of lava within that crater at the top of the spatter cone here uh, and also feeding a lava flow slash lava pond which you can see here in the foreground. You can see a little bit of incandescent. There's a little bubbling lava right here where some of these gases are being trapped beneath the crust and then they're uh, coagulating together and then rising and just causing a little bit of um, a little bit of bubbling on the surface of that lava lake. Uh, again, nothing official, but in just watching this for the last half hour or so, it does look like it's slowing down a little bit. Again, I can't confirm that, but just watching the activity, again, half an hour is not a good um, you know, amount of time to really you know, condemn a volcano, but it does look like things seem to be slowing down a little bit. But we'll have to get some official measurements and see if there's any confirmation there. I wanted to quickly, before we get to the update, um, go over a definition. I've had a lot of people ask me, is this a volcano? And exactly like, what is a volcano? So I'm going to turn to, for an official definition, rather than just getting something out of my head, here is the Glossary of Geology. So this is put out by the uh, American Geological Institute. So if there is sort of a dictionary of geologic terms, at least in the U.S., this would be it. So let's turn over to the definition of a volcano. I actually just got an email from a viewer asking this same sort of question. So according to this book, Take It or Leave It, Volcano, a vent in the surface of the earth through which magma and associated gases and ash erupt, uh, also in the form of a structure or form or structure, usually conical, that is produced by the ejected material. So it refers to both a vent and actually the, the shape or the form you get there. Um, so technically, according to that definition, if we have uh, volcanic material, gases, ash, lava, coming out of some opening in the earth, a vent, that qualifies as a volcano. So this is a volcano. I think the viewer was a little bit confused um, with a, a video I just put out, I believe yesterday, from Mauna Ulu in Hawaii. Mauna Ulu is a volcano, but it's, there's also Kilauea. So they were a little confused about, well, which is the right volcano? And as an example, um, I think the way I would define it, so now we're moving away from the textbook here, the, the source, to what the way I consider it, and I think most geologists might agree with this, is you have a volcanic system, so you have a, a common magma supply that feeds a volcanic system. So in the example of Hawaii, Kilauea is the system, but where that magma erupts at the surface can vary somewhat within the context of that larger volcano, Kilauea, and so you can get lots of vents or smaller volcanoes, if you will, within the context of that volcanic system. So for example, Kilauea, the volcanic system, has fed eruptions at Pu'uo'o, which is down on the Lower East Rift Zone. We had the, the uh, eruptions in Leilani Estates in 2018, even further down on the Lower East Rift Zone. There's been eruptions in the past in the Southwest Rift Zone. Mount Ulu, which was the, the volcano I showcased in that video yesterday. Um, and so there's been the summit, of course, has had and still does have a lava lake, an actual place where the material is making its way to the surface. So hopefully that helps clear up that um, those muddy waters a little bit. So this is a volcano that we're looking at in Iceland. This is absolutely volcano, just like we saw uh, a volcano erupt on December 18th, on January 14th, on February 8th, and here we have this ongoing eruption from March 16th. They're all related because they're all part of the same supply and plumbing system, <clears throat> excuse me, of magma, um, but hopefully that definition helps a little bit. So unlike previous updates where we spend time looking at the data, we're actually gonna move through the data pretty quickly today uh, because there's not a whole lot of different uh, things to talk about 
versus what I did a few days ago in my last update. But we're going to spend more time <clears throat> on the news and then also in some discussion. And I've got some little drawings for you here. So those of you who enjoy my uh, terrible artwork, uh, buckle up. You're in for a good one here. So if we look at the uh, seismicity over the last 24 hours, you can see uh, there's just not a lot happening. You know, just you know, very few earthquakes at all on the Reykjanes Peninsula. So moving on. GPS, of course, has been the whoops, the uh, most important thing that we've looked at over time. If we go to the Svartsengi GPS and look at the trend of movement in the up-down direction over the last few months, we can see it trending upwards in late January going into February. And then that uplift culminated in the eruption on February 8th. That emptied some of the magma from the storage zone in the subsurface out to the surface. So the ground elevation dropped uh, as some of that magma volume was expelled onto the surface. And then after that eruption, which only lasted a day or two, we saw inflation and the land uh, rise taking place. Uh, and then that culminated most recently with the March 16th eruption, which you can see is this big drop here. But since then, we've been focused on this trend here because the, unlike the previous eruptions, which only lasted a few days, so it made sense for inflation to resume as more magma was filling the storage zone. Here, what we can see is a clear upward trend where magma is filling the storage zone, but we also still have an erupting volcano, albeit, you know, it's, it's, it may be on its last legs. We don't, we'll have to see. Um, so we have to reconcile these two things. And I, I have a few just hair, you know, harebrained ideas, not really well thought out, but at least it might give you some conceptual visualization as to what might be happening in the subsurface. Um, so whatever sort of model or uh, hypothesis we put together, it has to be rooted in this data. This is this is the real data. The fun little drawings I'm going to show you, those are just possible interpretations, just hypotheses. But here's our real data. Ground uh, deformation, elevations, a slight uptick, maybe not even much, but then definitely since um, early April or so, a more uh, pronounced uh, inflation trend here. And where this goes going forward uh, is anyone's guess. So recognize that this is the data, earthquakes, um, GPS data, actual observations of the volcanic behavior. That is all real data that is uh, indisputable. But some of the things we might get to here in a minute would be more of the interpretation side. Here's another GPS station, the Blue Lagoon, showing the same sort of trend, right? It wasn't a whole lot of upward movement until early April. And then this real um, marked increase in the elevation of the land, uh, seemingly indicating that magma is accumulating in the subsurface um, while it is also simultaneously erupting. So that's it for the data. A quick, a quicker dose of the data than we normally take. Usually we dive into this stuff and spend more time here, but today we're going to spend more time on uh, the interpretation. And a thanks as always to Amanda Joe for sending me these great news articles that really kind of form the backbone of this update. She does great work and we appreciate her. Um, so there's a couple different news articles here with differing opinions. So even the Icelandic scientists are somewhat divided. And really, I think the if we're all being honest, no one has any idea. No one, I, I don't think anyone could make a solid prediction. Here's, you know, here's my right arm and a bunch of money on the line as to what this thing's going to do. Because we're now we're entering this unprecedented phase where we have uplift and an eruption taking place at the same time. So what's going to happen in the next week to two weeks to month to two months? Um, I think we're all just making good hypotheses based on the data. Um, but with limited information in the subsurface and what's happening there, we're all sort of, um, you know, th there's not a lot of confidence in those predictions. And, you know, as, you, as you'll see here, the Icelandic scientific community, they, there's differing opinions of, across the board. Uh, so that doesn't mean anyone's right, doesn't mean anyone's wrong. It's just we're in this, this phase of uncertainty and it should make sense then that you've got very different opinions kind of laid out. We're not going to the Met Office update today because they don't have a new one, but I would uh, encourage you to refer to that from my last update on Friday because they nicely laid out a few different possible scenarios that could 
take place as we go into the next few weeks here. And so they, they recognize probably the most probable scenarios uh, that were in front of us. So that was in that last update and in the most recent update from the Met Office. So here's an article that is mainly featuring uh, Professor Thorderson, who we've had a chance to talk to. So I just want to hit a couple of his um, highlighted quotes here. And basically his take in this article is that um, it's probably going to be a couple more weeks before there's the next event. The next event being either a magma intrusion into the subsurface or potentially uh, another eruption. And I don't think he says specifically where that eruption might be, but let's let's go through his quotes just quick, quickly here. And recognize as we read these two, this article has been Google translated from Icelandic to English. And so if the wording seems a little odd or some of the choice of words is off, uh, that's usually the case there. So, but it does a pretty good job and usually you can get the gist of it. So, uh, quote, naturally, this is just as expected. The flow from below splits into two paths and started by rising from the shallow magma chamber at the beginning of the current eruption. Um, and so he talks about uh, it's reaching the lower limit of the amount that could trigger an eruption even within the next week or two. Quote, we have direct flow up from the deeper magma chamber after the current eruption started. And then that flow also went to the shallow magma chamber. And then the, quote, land giant or what we call the intrusion started again, which stopped sometime after the eruption started. Uh, part of the flow from the deeper magma chamber is being pumped into the shallow one and little by little it fills up until it reaches the tolerance limit which is what is happening now um, and so we're, we're filling that storage zone and at some point it's going to reach some critical capacity or pressure which is going to uh, pr prompt it to move that magma into some new location either to the surface or into some other region in the subsurface um, Continuing on, it is most likely that it is how much magma remains from the previous eruption that controls it, as well as whether there is any variation, increase or decrease, from the deeper magma chamber. This is a certain balance. Something goes in and something goes out. This matters as far as the speed of the land giant or uplift is concerned. If the inflow changes, the speed of the land giant also changes. And so it can change where the chamber expands the most, that center can move and was moving a little west in a season. So the actual point of uplift, the central point of uplift, shifted slightly to the west um, during over the, uh, over the course of the last few eruptions. Um, so maybe we don't need to read all of these here, but I think you get the gist of it here. Um, and he also points out that one or two weeks can pass until there's news. Uh, right now, about half of the magma goes into the lower chamber. The other half goes up and is erupted. We're approaching 8 million cubic meters. And if we're going to exceed 10, we need at least four to five more days considering the, the flow. So, um, so more magma is going to continue to accumulate in that system. Uh, so that's his take on things. Uh, again, I don't think he's making any sort of prediction there. He's just, he's just uh, recognizing what's taking place. And then if we turn to another Icelandic scientist, uh, uh, volcanologist, uh, Professor Holskutsen, uh, he says absolutely nothing is there to indicate another eruption is about to begin. So he is under the, um, his opinion is that there's no data to suggest anything's gonna happen uh, in the near term moving forward. So at odds somewhat with the previous article we looked at. He says, although there is a, a loft under Svartsengi, a, a magma body inflation, we have watched it happen step by step. Now I'm just completely happy. Um, no, I don't understand this, but they are in charge of this, not me, he says, of the increased preparation of civil defense due to the increased risk of volcanic eruptions. Um, so it was discussed yesterday, a new eruption could start at any time, even if there's another eruption going on. And Arman said, I cannot accept such a thing unless I see more data than I have seen. So he doesn't seem to think that there's any data to suggest, to, to suggest excuse me, uh, that another eruption or intrusion event uh, is going to take place based on what's happening now. And so again, just, you know, I'm, I'm not taking sides here. I'm just presenting um, so it's confusing, right? If you're in the public here, you read one article and, and one sort of uh, perspective, and then you read another one, and, and it's quite confusing. And I think the bottom line is, like, we, we don't know. Uh, scientists, like any human, can have their own personal opinion, or, or, you know, we might favor one model versus another. But it, it seems that there's no real clear consensus here about what's going to happen. Um, 
And that's maybe why I think the Met Office one is, is always a nice, more measured response because that's a consortium of scientists. And so that press release and those updates that they put out, that's I, I would assume that's vetted and, and goes through a lot of different people to make sure they all are in agreement. Whereas some of these news articles are just talking to one particular person. And so you're going to get you're going to get that flavor. So uh, one more article here, actually two more, but this is uh, a different scientist. So this is um, Benedict Ulfigsen, and he talks about um, that the most likely thing is going to be that the we get another magma intrusion or movement of the magma, what they call a magma run, coming through this existing system. Uh, so here he says, we've not seen this situation before. We have an expanding magma chamber and an eruption. And usually we are seeing that when a magma chamber is feeding such an eruption, it is shrinking. Um, so he goes on to say, uh, it's not out of the question uh, that it would erupt somewhere else in, in response to this question, but I think it's very unlikely. We just expect a magma run to the, into the same magma tunnel, and in the unlikely event that something else happens, as can happen, it would have a warning that is much longer and much more active that we have been seeing. So if it's going to come through some other vent or establish some other vent, we would see some seismic data, we would see some other signals that indicate another vent uh, may become may be opened uh, that allows this eruption to take place in some other area. And so that's a little bit of that flavor there. Um, and then civil defense, there's an article that talks about civil defense. They sort of uh, have a similar opinion to the previous one where they think another eruption is likely and they're planning on it and they consider it to be most likely uh, at, the, at this current location where we have the spatter cone, that region uh, that they consider that um, you know, we're going to get maybe another vent or maybe we're going to get increased activity at the erupting event at this spatter cone. So just wanted to present you with some different um, opinions about where this is going. It can look quite confusing, but I would contend that this is normal. This is the way science works. Uh, and sometimes we just have to wait and see how things play out. And then we learn from that event and from that situation. And so we just have limited data. We just, I think, what everyone would like to see, and this is what I'll get to at the end here with my little drawings, is what this what this system looks like in the subsurface. And because there's a spectrum and a continuum from molten rock magma to solidified rock, there's lots of things in between, like kind of like sluggish magma and crystal mush and everything like that. There's just no good way to image or in other ways figure out what the plumbing system is like, where the magma is exactly. And that's why we're left relying on the earthquake activity and the ground deformation as our best um, sources of any information. But we don't know exactly where that magma is going, what, this, what the system looks like in three dimensions. And so it's quite tricky. Um, and so a lot of people have been very surprised about the whole prospect that we could have possibly two eruptions at once. Like this spatter cone here, could keep chugging along or possibly increase in flow and another vent, another eruption site may take place at the same time. And just to give you a little bit of context about that, if, if that's surprising to you, this has happened before. Uh, this happened in Hawaii and Hawaii did it for 10 years straight. So at Kilauea from 2008 to 2018, there was an active lava lake up at the summit. So here's a close-up map of that area. Here's the larger Kilauea caldera. Here's the Halemaumau crater, which is sort of nested within that larger caldera. And at the southeast end of that crater, from 2008 to 2018, there was an active, convecting, overturning at times uh, lake of lava for 10 straight years. And simultaneously, further down the east rift zone, here in the Middle East Rift Zone, there was an eruption from a vent called Pu'uo'o, and this erupted from 1983 to 2018. So for 35 straight years, this vent was pumping lava out to the surface. Pretty extraordinary. And it produced all this orange um, lava that you see here, mostly headed down to the sea, but there was uh, one instance where some of that flowed uh, out this way and, and came into or very close to the town of Pahoa. Uh, this was, I think, in 2014, 2015, something like that. And I was fortunate enough to be able to visit Hawaii multiple times during these eruptions, seeing the lava lake, also seeing 
um, some of these lava flows down here at their distal ends along the coastline. And we actually did hike in one year and saw the lava flow in this area over here, which is pretty remarkable. But then everything changed in 2018 when all the magma supply, so it actually overflowed. The lava lake got higher and higher, overflowed here, but then it drained down. The Pu'o'o uh, vent also drained, and all that magma ended up moving down the East Rift Zone and erupting uh, down here in a neighborhood which was unfortunate. And there was about 700 homes lost in the 2018 eruption you can see here in red. Also added a significant amount of real estate, new land to the coastline where this lava delta built out. But the whole point here is just to point out that um, having one volcanic system erupt from two vents and even sustain that over years is not completely unheard of. We've seen that in the past. So, okay, um, let's go to some models now. And so this was done by the Met Office and I showed this in a previous update, um, but I'm gonna show some of my drawings here as well. So this is highly simplified, but this sort of illustrates the idea that here's the magma chamber or the storage zone shown in yellow. Of course, it's very cartoonish just to make it an oval because we don't know the exact shape. The size, the geometry of this thing is uh, a complete unknown. Um, although we can look at solidified magma chambers in other places that are now exposed at the surface and look at them and sort of see the architecture and how those are put together. But this is just cartoonish just for illustration's sake. At about a four to five kilometer depth, here's the Svartsingi power plant. Here's the actively erupting spatter cone here. And so the idea here is magma comes into this shallow storage zone from depth um, and then comes through. And what we think was happening in March, when this thing started March 16th or so, for about a week or two, was that the magma coming into the system and the magma exiting the system towards the surface was pretty much in balance. Because remember, we didn't see much, if any, uplift at that time. That's this little stretch right here where we really didn't see any uplift of the ground uh, caused by more magma being put into storage. And so once we got, but what happened is it shifted. And so later, by the time we ent got into early April, over the past two and a half or so weeks, three weeks, I suppose, we've seen something that might be caused by something like this, where magma's coming into the system, um, but only a little bit is making its way to the surface and more magma is being put into storage, which has caused the ground to rise here. So that's what these arrows are showing here. So this is the situation we've seen since April, uh, early April, I suppose. And we can see that again on our GPS plots here. So about from this point on, more of the ground being uplifted. And the uplift, we interpret that to be caused by the uh, con additional magma being put into storage here. So for a while, it seemed it was keeping pace magma coming in, magma going out, but now there's more magma coming in than it's going out through the spatter cone. And so this is what the Met Office had put together, you know, and, and for all I know, it looks exactly like this in the subsurface, you know, it could be a red little squiggly line, a big oval blob, and then a nice little curve going up to the surface, but probably not. It's usually much more complicated than that. The magma is taking pathways that exist in the, within the existing rocks in the crust. Uh, that could be horizontal zones where there's breaks between different lava flows and different units and so those might have more permeability and more space for the lava to travel there could be fractures usually vertical or nearly vertical that the magma occupies and travels in as well so let me show you what i put together and again th these are i just spitballed a few quick ideas i did not spend hours on this as you'll quickly see these are what i would probably call very half-baked ideas um, that probably could use a little bit more time. Undoubtedly, some of you will have the time and energy to look at these and critique them, and that's fine. I'm not saying they are right. I'm not saying they are wrong, um, but they're just maybe a few ideas that might explain the data. Because remember, there's the data, right? Ultimately, we're trying to figure out what's happening in the subsurface and trying to explain this trend right here. Uh, so without further ado, here's a few ideas just sketched out really quickly. So we could have potentially, so let me put you, this is a cross section from west to east. Here's the Svartsingi power plant with the steam coming out. Here's a hill just to the east of it, Seelingerfeld. And here's our actively erupting spatter comb that we've been focusing on. 
So we may have a system that is somewhat tiered in that the pathways are somewhat stacked. So maybe as the magma was coming up in March, it was following this pathway and feeding the eruption. Um, but as this conduit became filled, more of the magma had to rise and start filling the storage zone. So this would be March and going into April. Some of the, so some of the magma is still coming through here, but because these conduits are somewhat narrow, you can only fit a certain amount or, or volume of magma through these conduits. And because there's more magma coming up from below that can fit into this tube system, if you will, that means that more of the magma has to go into storage. And as more magma fills the storage zone, that causes the uplift. So again, a half-baked idea, uh, tear it apart, tell me it's wrong, I'm fine with it. But I just, I just wanted to show people some just quick visuals as to how this might be playing out in the subsurface. So there's one idea and without any better, um, you know, fancier name for it, let's just call this the tiered system. Okay, so you've got a, one level down below and then another storage area uh, up above. Uh, Another model uh, could be more interconnected. And this again is very cartoonish. Um, so it could be something like this where the magma is coming up and able to go directly up through the dike to the spatter cone. Uh, maybe initially it was going into the storage zone and going right through here in early March. Um, but now it's filling up that storage zone and causing uplift uh, potentially. So again, these are I haven't fleshed these out completely. I'm not publishing a paper. Uh, please don't take these as th the gospel truth of magma bodies beneath uh, Iceland. Um, also recognize with all these models, I've drawn these in two dimensions. So how these would look in three dimensions, if you imagine the, maybe there's a magma storage zone in one place, but then either towards you or away from you in three dimensional space, there's another one. And so uh, I could barely draw in two dimensions, much less three. And so I didn't even try to tackle a three dimensional model, uh, but someone else can. The problem is we just don't know, right? All we know is the ground's being uplifted while this, this eruption's taking place. The earthquakes and other data tell us that the, the storage zone exists about four to five kilometers in depth, and that's kind of it. So whatever picture you paint using those rigid data points, uh, that leaves you a lot of, a lot of wiggle room, a lot of uh, latitude there. So maybe something like this is possible. Um, this one, I guess I'm calling this one constriction in the system model. And so here's the magma rising from depth. Uh, maybe here I've just drawn, just because I was kind of getting uh, zesty and sassy with this whole thing, a little more interconnected and more elaborate system of sills and storage space in here. But perhaps there's a constriction in the system that only allows a certain amount to flow through. Now, maybe that was more open in the early days in March and since then, it has um, some of that maybe magma has solidified. I don't know. Maybe it ripped out, ripped out a chunk of the wall rock, and the magma transported that in here, and it's partially blocking it. And that's why we have a reduction in flow at the surface. Um, whatever. Just some ideas here. And so maybe a constriction is not allowing the full volume of magma from depth to enter and erupt at the surface through the spatter cone and therefore more magma must be stored in the subsurface which would cause the uplift. So there's uh, half-baked idea number three. Moving on to the last one, half-baked idea number four. Um, this one doesn't really, the, the plumbing system here can be whatever you want it to be. I just drew something sort of simple and generic. The main thing here would be changing the flow rate. So my short little arrow here would be perhaps the influx from the deeper source in March was lower and we were getting all of it out to the surface, uh, but now it's increased and now it's increased and maybe it's a combination of this and the previous one where you can't get all the magma through this small conduit system to the surface. And so more of that magma that's coming up from below is needing to be stored in the storage space here. And so as long as, again, as long as we account for a continuous eruption and something that allows for the elevation to continue rising, what we call inflation, um, then anything anything goes, right? Any of these possibilities could exist. So, so just some ideas there, uh, increased flow rate perhaps, constrictions in the system, uh, some sort of interconnected system or tiered system or some combination thereof, right? And, and, and most importantly, the 
probably the greatest probability of all is all four of these models are dead wrong and it's something I haven't even considered. So um, yeah, could be something else. Um, anyone can be an expert at this point because we just don't know what this looks like in the subsurface. We just know we have an eruption, we know we have inflation and the ground rising, magma being put into storage, and beyond that uh, we're left with multiple scenarios as to how this plays out. Will it keep erupting through the spatter cone? Will some new um, vent open up in the system, maybe near the spatter cone, maybe not near the spatter cone? Will we just continue to see inflation? Maybe this breaks through and creates an arrested dike, a, a dike that doesn't quite make it to the surface, right? So that'll add more storage space for the magma to occupy. Um, of course, that or a new vent opening up, we should see signs that those are taking place with earthquakes, earthquake activity. So until we get those earthquakes or until we get change in the uh, eruptive behavior of this vent, uh, we just have to kind of wait and see. So uh, so hopefully that was helpful. Oh, it looks like there's some people there right now. So probably not a good idea, but maybe they're sampling lava. Who might I judge? Uh, if I could get out there safely, I would. Uh, but a couple people there. It gives you a little perspective of the scale, I suppose. Um, yeah, and they may be sampling. I don't know. Although they don't have some of the, usually they make you wear like reflective vests and some other things. Anyway, the last thing I have for you here is unrelated to the activity around Glendivik, but as I was loading up this update and putting together things, I did notice, so notice I told you not much happening with earthquakes, right? Well, what I kind of hid from you was the overall look of Iceland. And <laughs> as you can see here, we do have one big earthquake to just mention briefly, a 5.4 earthquake that happened this morning. Uh, it's right underneath and near the Bardabunga system. So another volcanic system in central Iceland, a much bigger, more explosive and potentially dangerous system. We can see the earthquake was very shallow. Uh, 5.4 is, is a good sized quake. Uh, there was a few, uh, there was at least one news item on this earthquake this morning that I was managed to catch. Well, Amanda Joe caught it and she sent it to me. Um, and so they mentioned that, you know, this earthquake could be the beginning of a longer period where the volcano was only recovering after its eruption from 2014 and 2015. Um, this is the biggest earthquake in this area in nine years, so it's, it is significant. Um, the Met Office has noticed a slight increase in crustal movements in the area since the beginning of last year. This could be the start of a process that lasts for many years, but there are indications that there is an increase in pressure in the area. However, there's no reason to increase the response today and not expect that anything will start now. So basically, it's a big earthquake. It's worth watching and monitoring, but there's still nothing to indicate that an eruption has begun uh, beneath, the, beneath the glacier there. Um, and it was felt in Dalvik, so I'm not sure exactly where that town is, but some community nearby. And then I also found, this was interesting, I thought too, um, somehow I, I stumbled across an older, this is from a year ago, so this is from February 2023, but a little more than a year ago, there was a similar sized earthquake there that they ended up doing some analysis on and the Met Office determined it was caused by a magma intrusion. Uh, and so it's very likely that this earthquake here uh, could be related to magma movement, makes sense, um, but is not indicative of an eruption, right? This, this could have been caused by magma forcing its way into the subsurface, um, just like this one that happened a year ago. So just giving you a little bit of context there that we had a similar sized earthquake about a little over a year ago that did not result in any sort of eruption or eruptive behavior. So, uh, so hopefully that's helpful. Hopefully we can continue to monitor this. Hopefully the drawings, the little half-baked sketches I put together were of some use to you. Um, we will continue to monitor as always, and I will get you another update soon. Uh, the next big thing moving forward is on Tuesday, I'll be doing a video interview with Greg Stock, who's the park geologist at Yosemite National Park. And so he will be awesome, I'm sure, and you guys can hopefully tune into that. That will be a recorded uh video but i will probably get that out 
uh, probably Tuesday afternoon. So as soon as I wrap up with him, I'll get that uploaded. So you can look for that along with any Iceland updates uh, as things develop there. So thanks again for joining me. Hope you're well. Appreciate all your support of the channel and learning with me as we just watch this cool case study in earth processes and eruptive behavior unfold in Iceland. It's just a great opportunity to learn together. Be well and take care. Thanks so much.